Hi, Mike Gaben here with some more KSP math. In the original tutorial, I talked about a couple of rendezvous situations that extended beyond the basic time transfer between two circular orbits. Both situations required establishing a phasing orbit to adjust the timing and achieve a rendezvous. In the math portion of the video, I talked about how to calculate the delta v costs of these maneuvers. Specifically, how to use the vis viva equations when one or both of the orbits are not circular. So, without any further delay, let's do the math. Back in episode 3, I talked about Hohmann transfers. That's the standard technique that is used to move from one circular orbit to another circular orbit in the same plane. The idea is to connect the two orbits with an elliptical transfer orbit. If we were traveling from orbit 1 to orbit 2, we would accomplish this by first performing a burn at position 1, and then riding the transfer orbit halfway around to position 2, where we would perform a second burn to insert ourselves into the second orbit. In that episode, I then used the Law of Conservation of Energy and Kepler's second law to derive the two formulas for calculating what the delta v requirements would be for these two burns. This is the formula for the delta v for burn 1, and here's the formula for burn 2. It's important to understand that this process is entirely symmetrical in the reverse order. You could just as easily be starting in orbit 2 and move to orbit 1, but the formulas would remain exactly the same. The second formula would be used to calculate the delta v for burn 2, which would be the first burn that you would perform and the first formula would be used for burn 1, now the second burn to perform. So when you see the delta V1, don't think of it as the formula for calculating the delta V of the first burn you would perform. Rather, it is the formula for calculating the burn at position 1, which is the burn at the lower altitude. Similarly, delta V2 is not necessarily the second burn chronologically, but rather the amount of the burn at position 2, which is the burn at the higher altitude. Before I get into using these formulas again, I want to clean them up a little bit by introducing a new bit of terminology. If I take the average of the two radii of the orbits, that is, add them and divide by two, I get this value A, which we call the semi-major axis of the elliptical transfer orbit. Notice that in both the formulas, in the fraction inside one of the square roots, we have a 2 in the numerator and an R1 plus R2 in the denominator which is the reciprocal of the semi-major axis A. That means we can replace that part of the formulas with just a single A in the denominator of each fraction. This doesn't really change anything when performing calculations, but it does simplify the formulas a bit and make them easier to remember. Also, the semi-major axis is a useful number in other places, so it is worth knowing it. The only reason I didn't introduce it back in episode 3 is because there was enough stuff being thrown at you in that tutorial already. With that done, let's look at what we did in the second rendezvous of this video. We started in an elliptical orbit with a periapsis of 687 kilometers and an apoapsis of 3,352 kilometers. Note that I am measuring all distances from the center of Kerbin. Recall that Kerbin has a radius of 600 kilometers. We ultimately moved ourselves into a circular orbit with a radius of 700 kilometers to rendezvous with Jeb. We accomplished this by first performing a burn at Apoapsis to create this transfer orbit. We then rode this elliptical orbit halfway around and performed two burns at Periapsis. The first was to create a phasing orbit, which I'm not showing here, to time our final rendezvous with Jeb and then a final burn once we had returned to periapsis to match velocities with Jeb. What I'm interested in is calculating the total cost of all three of these burns. Let's start with burn 1. Note that this is not a Hohmann transfer. A Hohmann transfer starts and ends with circular orbits, but here we are starting from an elliptical orbit. In fact, burn 1 changes one elliptical orbit into another elliptical orbit, how are we to apply our delta v formulas to this situation? Don't worry, it can be done, and it isn't even that difficult. We start by imagining we are in a circular orbit with a radius equal to our apoapsis. We then calculate the burn required to lower our periapsis down to our target orbit. This is a straightforward Hohmann transfer, and as this is the burn at the higher altitude, 
we use the delta V2 formula. Here are the numbers for the formula. Recall that mu is the standard gravitational parameter. We can look up this number for Kerbin on the KSP wiki, or you can recall that it is simply the universal gravitational constant, uppercase G, multiplied against the mass of Kerbin, which you can get in-game in the tracking station. R1 and R2 are self-explanatory, and A is the semi-major axis. Plugging into the formula, we get this, and pushing through a calculator produces a delta V of 423 meters per second. Of course, we didn't start with a circular orbit, we started with this orbit. Let's now calculate the delta V requirement for lowering our periapsis from our hypothetical circular orbit to the periapsis of our actual orbit. We use the exact same formula. In fact, the only thing that changes is the value of R1, which is now 687,000 meters. Plugging in and pushing this through a calculator gets 428 meters per second. Now look at the diagram carefully and consider what must be the delta V requirement for burn 1, which raised our, the periapsis of our orbit from 787 kilometers to 700 kilometers. I'm hoping that you realize that it is going to be the difference in the two delta Vs that we just calculated. That is, the delta V for burn 1 is 428 minus 423, or just 5 meters per second. Now I know that this seems almost insignificantly small, and in this situation it probably is, but being able to calculate the delta V cost from one elliptical orbit to another is a useful skill, and it won't always be as cheap as what you see here. Now let's look back and see what actually happened. I never did set up a maneuver for this burn, but we can still see what the delta V spent was by simply comparing the velocity of rescue 2 before and after the burn was completed. Just before the burn, my velocity was 598 meters per second. And then we start the burn. Again, I'm just waiting for my periapsis to get up to 100. There we go, 603 meters per second. I added 5 meters per second to my velocity, exactly as would have been predicted. Now how about the next two burns, which eventually reduced my transfer orbit to a circular orbit of a radius of 700 kilometers. As these two burns were performed in the same location, we can calculate the sum of the two burns as if this was done in a single burn. Indeed, if it wasn't for having to rendezvous with Jeb, there would have been no reason for a phasing orbit and this would have been done in just a single burn. Thankfully, this combined burn is just a standard Hohmann transfer burn. As this burn is at the lower altitude, we use the delta V1 formula. Here are the numbers, plugging in, and after a bit of calculation, we get 643 meters per second. Let's compare this to what actually happened. Now I did use a maneuver node for the first part of this burn, and we can see here that the amount of that burn was 439 meters per second. The second part of the burn was actually done in a series of short burns as Rescue 2 matched velocities with Jebediah. Adding up all of these individual burns would sure be tedious, but thankfully we don't have to. All we have to do is look at what our closest approach relative velocity was before we started reducing speed. And you can see here it was 205 meters per second. 205 plus 439 gets us a combined 644 meters per second, only one off from what was predicted by theory. I hope you are seeing how useful the two Hohmann transfer formulas are. With them you can calculate delta V requirements for transferring between any two orbits that are in the same plane. While working within a single sphere of influence, all that's really left to talk about are inclination changes, but that is going to have to be a topic for a separate tutorial. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you for the next one.